in Las Vegas are uncertain over what caused the death of former heavyweight champion Sonny Liston. You always told me anything you want to do, do your best and be the best at it. He was a man amongst men. Liston had to fight for everything he got. He's a good man and he's a kind man. He's a leg breaker for the mob. Sonny Liston's America's worst nightmare. Sonny wanted this title because he thought it would complete him. He wanted respect. Nobody wanted to be associated with him. No respectable person. His life could have gone in one direction. It went in the other. Everybody was talking about it. It was one of the biggest sporting events in history. Fix, fix, fix. He's not only just reviled, he can't even get a job. Sonny went to what he knew best. He was always involved in a criminal culture, whether by choice or necessity. There were a lot of people who had an invested interest in shutting Sonny up. Sonny Liston's fate was sealed in the womb. So many people wanted Sonny dead. The question is, who got to him first? Now, as mentioned, we're joined by Sean Asael, who has written The Murder of Sonny Liston, Las Vegas, Heroin and Heavyweights. Sean, thanks for joining us. Joe, it's a pleasure to be here. Can we start at the end, if that's okay? January 1971 and Sonny Liston's wife, Geraldine, returning to the house. Uh, she uh, opens the door after being away for a couple of weeks, hadn't been able to uh, get in touch with her husband over Christmas and New Year's. Maybe she thought he was on another one of his benders. Um, she opens the door and is immediately hit by uh, a smell that she first thinks is something uh, been left on the stove. She looks downstairs, can't find, can't, she can't find Sonny, and she walks up to their bedroom on the second floor and it um, becomes apparent that the smell is not something that's been left on the stove. The smell is the rotting flesh of her husband who's been dead for at least five days. And what state was he in when she found him, Sean? Uh, have you ever seen somebody who's been five days dead, Joe? Not recently. Yeah, it's not good. Uh, the methane was starting to come up from under his body. Uh, his um, his skin was bubbling. Uh, it was you know he was in a, uh, an advanced state of decomposition. I suppose I meant more when I asked the question. I, I presume that much, but he was lying on the bed, face down. Was there anything suspicious about the nature of how she found him? Uh, well, I mean, there was everything suspicious. Um, in this case, there was a uh, a small bit of um, marijuana that was found on the. Uh, on the dresser, what I should say, Joe, is that we actually, it's not entirely clear to us what she found when she found him because a number of hours passed before she calls the police. And all we know is what the police found. And I make some um, note in my book of the fact that the police found a bindle of heroin in plain view on the kitchen counter and used that for a search warrant. Um, and yet Geraldine had three some odd hours to clean that house before the police came. So I make some question as to why was that heroin there if Geraldine seemed to have cleaned everything else up. We don't know what she found. We know what the cops found. What has she said about what she found? Has she, I mean, I presume she was quizzed on what she was doing in those few hours with the corpse. Uh, you know, all we really know, not so much. I mean, Geraldine in her later years didn't talk much about this. And then when she stopped talking, she... Uh, she started charging for interviews because she was not left terribly well off, and that was the result of, of Sonny's life as well as his death. Um, uh, you know, the police report notes that um, while she was sitting there, she was in too much, uh, you know, she, she was in too much of a state to really talk to them. So she didn't ever, she never said much to the cops. Okay. So this is where we have to delve a bit into Sonny Liston's life. And it's amazing, really, for such a well-known figure, almost an iconic figure, when you think of the amount of people that have that poster of him and Muhammad Ali in their bedroom. Yeah. Not, not a poster I suspect he much likes, but he's a part of it anyway. For somebody who is so famous and so a part of that folklore, uh, I was actually surprised how little I knew of his life. The 24th of 25 children which is a hell of a way to come into the world. And really, from early on, life was tough for Sonny Liston. Yeah, 24th and 25, with no birth certificate. So what haunts Sonny and what's his sort of rosebud metaphor is that without even a birth certificate to announce his entry into the world, he was always lost. He never really knew who he was. 
Uh, he um, is regularly whipped by his father. He's used as a field hand. His mother leaves um, to find greener pastures in St. Louis, leaving him alone. And then one day he, um, he raises enough money to, to go and try to find her. And as the story goes, he thinks that when he gets off the bus in St. Louis, it'll be like the country. And he'll just say, where's my mom? And somebody will point him there. In fact, the police take him and sort of take him under their wing. And it's the first and only time that he has good relations with the cops, because soon after that, he's reunited with his mother. And so begins the sort of life on the streets of um, a guy, a six foot one man with the biggest hands anybody would ever, had ever seen. And so he starts rousting people for their nickels and dimes uh, until that lands him in prison. And as I write in the book, a lot, most people lose their uh, careers in prison. Sonny found his. Yeah, he comes under the influence of uh, Father Stevens, a Catholic priest who also ran the prison gym. You referenced Sonny Liston's hands. There's a quote from Father Stevens. He was the most perfect specimen of manhood I had ever seen and talked about the big shoulders and the strength and the biggest hands that you've ever yeah. seen. This is a turning point of sorts for Liston. Not of sorts. It's, you know, it's full stop. I mean, he, he, he then finds that he doesn't have to um, roust people on the street. He can do it inside the ring. Uh, and not only does Father Stevens catch his uh, catch, um, see what's what um, Sonny could amount to, um, you know. So do the local promoters, and so does the mob. And so what you see is Sonny's rise through the Golden Globes um, until he turns pro, and it becomes clear that he's outgrown St. Louis. Um, the mob is is you know has brighter things in store for him, and so he goes to Philadelphia and. Uh, and comes under the uh, the uh, tutelage of Blinky Palermo and and the mob there, and, and he loves it, and the mob loves him. Uh, David Remnick wrote in his book about Muhammad Ali's early years. He said Liston was the last great champion to be delivered straight into the hands of the mob. So this relationship he had with the mob, you said he loved it. They obviously loved it. Uh, how did it work? How did it benefit them both? Um, did he ever try and escape their clutches as he grew in prominence? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, back in those days, uh, you didn't really have to fix a fight to make your money, right? It was all in the matchup. And some, to some extent, I suppose it's still that way. And um, it benefited the mob because they were able to control the, you know, control the take. I mean, you know, having a, a fighter like Sonny, they're able to control the odds and they make money and he's able to sort of, outrun that that street tough past of his but also try to find himself because therein lies the tension and listed at least that i found in my reporting i think others have written too that he feels like boxing can complete him and so his rise up the heavyweight ranks parallels his stature in america except for the fact that these are complicated times this is the civil rights era sonny has a complicated relationship with civil rights in fact he doesn't want to be a part of it and so the people in the civil rights movement who are fighting for their freedoms actually don't want to see List and fight for the title when it comes his time against Floyd Patterson. Mm. It takes Patterson to say, I, we need to give this man his fight. And I think you mentioned David Remnick. Um, I think Remnick writes in his book that Patterson packed a loser suitcase um, to, their, to their first fight. It, it was just he was so convinced that he was going to lose. He, does, he loses once, he loses twice. And the moment that... Um, the moment that Liston becomes champion, he thinks he's going to see um, a parade for him in Philadelphia yeah. when he flies home. And this is the rosebud moment because he steps off the plane. He thinks he's going to be um, welcomed the way his idol Joe Lewis was, and there's nobody there. And so when you ask me, well, you know, how does the mob change? Does Sonny ever try to escape the mob's clutches? It's at that moment where he really could have gone in another direction and he doesn't. He decides if the public is gonna turn his back on him, he's gonna turn his back on the public. And there and there we see the next, you know, eight, eight years of his life. I read a line even around the time of the Floyd Patterson fight that President Kennedy went so far as to urge Patterson to find an opponent with better character, he said yeah. of Sonny Liston. Extraordinary that President Kennedy is intervening almost in that way. He's uh, turning his back on the civil rights movement. I get that that may not be popular in, in huge quarters, but I wouldn't think it's an insurmountable problem. He wouldn't be the first fighter or the first sports person who didn't really want to get involved in politics. What was it about Liston's general demeanor, if, there, if that was the issue, that meant he couldn't quite connect with the public at large? 
um, uh, you know, Sonny wasn't glib. Um, you know, he didn't grow up, um, you know, shaking hands and being told and being praised. Uh, he, he grew up being beaten and, and being turned into a strike breaker for, for um, the mob when he wasn't boxing. Uh, he wasn't a people person. I mean, you, you know, he was the kind of guy that you met in a dark corner and you were afraid for your life. That worked for him in the ring. Um, it, uh, it didn't work for him so much out of the ring. He tried. Um, he really did, because we, I mentioned his idol was Joe Lewis, who was the personification of a people person. Um, you know, there's a story in the book about how somebody comes up to Sonny at a, at a craps table in Vegas and says, you're Sonny Liston. And Sonny says, yeah, I know. And so that's that's the kind of warmth you got out of him. Um, you know, there, there are myriad stories told by reporters who tried to profile him and, and you know, he menaced them. So, yeah, he wasn't he wasn't the kind of person that um, civil rights movement or not was going to be a beloved figure. Mm. Um, and of course, there's the famous, famous Esquire cover of him in a Santa hat that plays on that. And as I write in the book, you know, he looked like a, uh, he looked like a, uh, you know, a Santa ready to shiv a reindeer. I mean, it was just, you know, that was sunny and that worked for him. Yeah, so he just wasn't equipped as a person to court the public the way, well, f I, the obvious comparison might be Muhammad Ali was. Was he, uh, an angry person, like in his general demeanor, Sean, was he, he clearly must have been damaged in some ways because he had such a tough upbringing. Was there an anger there about that? Um, you know, there was a, I think Sonny was, was, I think anger was baked in the cake. I don't think it always had to be there. I think that, that he was, he had legitimate grievances about the way he was treated by the press. I think he had legitimate grievances about the way his contracts were cut up, how he was defrauded. Um, I don't think that it was necessarily um, preordained that he had to end up the way he did. Mm. Uh, he was capable, believe it or not, and, and there's a great scene in the book of, of him going to a bullfight with his adopted son and wife in Mexico across the border during the filming of some black exploitation film that he was involved with later in his career. And the the people in the stands um, in this bullfight um, um, gave him a standing ovation. The matadors genuflected and bowed towards him. Mm -hmm. And there's a story about as he's driving home, he looks out the window smiling and tells his wife that was a really great day. Um, and the fact that Sonny got to see it filled him with warmth. So Sonny was capable of great warmth. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he just he had to trust you. So the mob in his career, there are suspicions he may have thrown fights, like, for instance, his wife, uh, Geraldine, says of the famous Ali punch. She said, I think Sonny gave that second fight away, is her sense. And people have looked at the quote-unquote phantom punch and wondered. Others have said, well, it was a solid right hand, and that's all there was to it. So to what extent did the mob dictate Sonny Liston's performance in fights? Well, that's the question, isn't it? Um... You know, I think in the second fight, I have no doubt that that, that was thrown. Um, there was something that we call the secret percentage theory. I wasn't the first to come up with it, but it became more and more and more persuasive to me that if, I, if Liston thought that he was going to get a piece of Ali's future earnings, having no idea that Ali was about to um, um, become a conscientious objector in, in, in the Vietnam War and, and be exiled, that you know he'd rather just sit at home and collect his checks while Ali made money for him. I mean that's that's a mob's way of thinking. Sonny was raised by the mob. That was a mob kind of move. Uh, it's later in his career that we're trying to make a comeback that we get to the fight that certainly the people at Showtime who did our documentary were persuaded that Sonny was ordered to fix a fight, um, didn't, and the mob got very angry about that. And that that brings us all the way towards the end of his life. Yes. Okay. And did Liston ever? hint that he may have uh, given that fight away, the Ali fight, the second fight? Um, you know, there were all sorts of hints. Um, what, what I was shocked by is when I went to Las Vegas um, to write the, to report this book in 2015, mm. there were still people that in the barber shops and around who were around at that time who remembered hearing Sonny say that he had a piece of Ali's future earnings. So the secret percentage theory, more than just a rumor, I mean, these were people that said, heard Sonny bragging about it. I should say that whether or not he did is almost irrelevant. Sonny thought he did. And so whether or not he was told that he'd get Ali's earnings, and by the time Ali faces, um, you know, Frazier um, at the Garden, and they're each, you know, 
position to make you know five million dollars. Yeah. Sonny's walking around thinking he has a piece of that. There are a lot of people who don't want to hear him say that. Yes, no doubt. So your book is called The Murder of Sonny Liston, Las Vegas Heroin and Heavyweights. Talk to us then. We've said we've set the background, we've we've talked about the mob connections. Talk to us about the murder of Sonny Liston. Yeah. So the autopsy reads um um you know, natural causes with with um, um, heroin metabolites in his system. And so it's the accidental overdose is what most people think. And yet for 30 some odd years, I've been hearing conspiracy theories that there was more. And uh, I go to Las Vegas to try to unravel those theories. And what I find is that um, Sonny was in the crosshairs of a very, very, very dangerous period, both for Las Vegas and him. He was under federal investigation. Um, there was a, a drug dealer who he crossed in a setup who um, had a contract out on his life. Um, as I say, he's making noises about an Ali, Ali fight that nobody wants him to make, not the mob, not the Nation of Islam. Um, he's involved with a, with a gang leader, and he's snorting heroin with that gang leader and his son. He's dating a junkie. I mean, I, I could go on. Yeah. And so as I begun, begin unraveling this, and I should say that the, the idea for the book was that most, there have been a number of great biographies of Sonny. Nick Tosh's, um, the late Nick Tosh's, wrote a phenomenal one, and I encourage everybody to read those. But most of those biographies raced through the last year of Sonny's life. By setting a book entirely in that last year, I was able to just sort of develop what not a lot of people knew about. And so by the time I'm done, I am astounded by the cast of characters that want Sonny dead. Um, and that's not even the end of the book because then an unmarked envelope comes to my house. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll ask you about that unmarked envelope in just a moment. Feel free to elaborate maybe one more answer even on the last year of his life and just how out of control it was. I mean, he's, he's doing heroin. It, various people may want him dead. He's carrying on relationships. Just completely out of control. Yeah, Geraldine sees it. I mean, he stopped, you know, he stopped... For, for a drunken driving by a cop, um, in, you know, on his way back from Las, Ve uh, Los Angeles, where you're supposedly picking up heroin. I don't know that the story is true, but as the story goes, before, you know, when he saw the cop trailing him, he took out a bindle from under his seat and threw it out his window, you know, and the cop shows up and the car is covered by, by, by white snow. But, you know, the, in that time, Sonny was Sonny. The cops let him go. I make a, a pretty good, compelling case, I think, for the fact that one of the reasons the cops let him go so often was that he was snitching for a, uh, you know, for a police detective who was the head of the organized crime bureau there. So, again, you know, was Sonny snitching? There's a lot of people who got killed in Vegas for doing that. Yeah. So, yeah, he was, in, but he had that champion's faith in himself, the faith that all boxers have, that, you know, he can, he could duck any punch. And, uh, you know, he just didn't see that one coming. Uh, yeah. So you look into you all look this, into and then you mention an unmarked envelope, envelope, envelope arrives. Uh, it's um, it comes. It's the um, recollection. Uh, some years after Sonny's death, a Las Vegas police informant walks into the Vegas PD, a hero cop who had gone rogue, and had been um, dealing drugs with this police informant, um, had. Uh, um, the informant claimed threatened to kill him. The informant was looking for some protection and said, by the way, I also know who killed Sonny Liston. And he points the finger at this rogue cop. Um, hero in the 70s, uh, criminal by the 80s. And, um, and this transcript of his interview lays out why, you know, why he thinks this rogue cop did it. And so, like all investigative reporters, I, I went to Facebook to find him, and I did. And he was right there, and I emailed him, and I said, you know, this is what I'm doing. Would you be interested in talking to me? And he wrote back, um, sure, come on by. And so I, sh I show up to his house, and he looks, you know, like a biker with a, you know, flat top, um, still huge biceps. And he opens the door, and he says, so I guess you're here to ask me if I kill Sonny Liston. True story. And um, you'll see that in the book. You'll see that in the Showtime documentary. And over four hours, he admitted to killing a lot of people, both in Vietnam and um, um, watching people die as, a, as an undercover cop. But he said he didn't kill Sonny and pointed the finger at somebody else so that by the end of the book, I have this swirl. Who did it? Who didn't do it? Mm -hmm. um, do I have a single definitive suspect? No. But, and, and Joe, I'll just sort of 
you know, leave you with this. I was more convinced than I had ever been that the preponderance of evidence suggested a murder, not natural causes. And the people have quibbled with me, but I'm telling you, I believe it. Mm. One of the theories One I've the seen theories there I've seen is, there is there that is, uh, it was the mob, was because the frankly, mob because Sonny, 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 Sonny knew too much. Knew too much. Well, and the, and the folks at Showtime, um, who went even farther than I did, and I was thrilled that they did, um, are, you know, interviewed people who will argue that Sonny's, um, second, Sonny's last fight in the Jersey Armory with Chuck Wepner, uh, the Bayonne Bleeder, was supposed to be a loss. Sonny wasn't supposed to have won. In fact, you know, and I interviewed Wepner about this, he sent Wepner into an ice bath for five days, he beat him so badly. Before that fight, somebody was with Sonny, told me that he was meeting with mobsters in corners about, you know, money laundering and other things. So that was a bad bit, piece of business all the way around. Mm. Um, but the fact that that, that fight um, ended in a win for him was perhaps the worst piece of business for, for the mob. The uh, coroner ruled he died of natural causes. I don't suppose there was any great lengthy investigation into his death? And that's the point. There isn't. There was no homicide investigation. So that's what this book tried to be. When people ask me, well, you didn't solve the crime, I say, no, I didn't, but I gave ho I gave Sonny the homicide investigation he never had. Um, I don't have subpoena power. I can't knock on people's doors. I mean, this isn't you know this isn't CSI me. But you know, I did what I could as a reporter, and and I I'm pretty uh, pleased in the book that is written the way it is. Uh, people have compared it to Elmore Leonard, but it's it's nonfiction. I mean, all of this happened. Mm. There's not much of a silver lining, really, with Sonny's existence. It seems like it was uh, difficult right from the off. Even at the peak of his powers, he lacked the popularity. Maybe on, on some level, he was only human, that he must have craved. He was under the control of the mob, and then things careered right out of control. So I presume it struck you as well as you digested all of that in one package as a pretty grim existence. Yes and no. Um, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, you can, you can be, to some extent, he had existential bad luck, you know, in his fight against Leotis Martin, his second to last fight, which should have been a walkover because Martin was his former s sparring partner. You know, he was in line for a title fight during a comeback. He detaches, you know, Martin's retina, but Martin lands a lucky punch. Sonny goes down and there goes his, the dreams of a title fight again for his, you know, comeback. So the thing about Sonny though, is that he was in control of a lot of his life. It didn't have to go that way. Mm. He just pushed the envelope over and over and over again. So while, you know, while to some extent um, he, he led a fatalist existence, he had plenty of opportunities to turn in a different direction. I, I must add, including having a wonderfully devoted and loving wife. Mm. And so he lived out his days in Vegas. He lived out his last last few years. I mean, jogging suits, you know, running on the running on the green, endless buffets, an institutional supply of showgirls, and and what the book does. Uh, and again, I'm proud of this. It's something I think that that hasn't been done. Is it looks at in the late '60s and early '70s uh, the segregated nature of Las Vegas, um, the way that the West Side, which was the area built by African Americans, was redlined into a ghetto. I mean, there was a lot of really ugly race race relations. And if you can imagine this, Joe, you know, between the casinos on the Strip and the Red Line Ghetto, there was one street that connected them, and Sonny was probably the only person who could traverse those two worlds, and he did it in a convertible pink Cadillac. <laughs> Sean, I mean, it, it, when we talk now about the mob and the influence it had in boxing, it's almost a cliche. Was it widely known at the time, like in boxing dispatches or reports, even in the national newspapers at the time of uh, Liston's fights with Ali, would, would, would there have been open references to the mob and, 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 and the influence he was under? Oh, I mean, not just references. I mean, they were headlines. They were blaring headlines. In fact, it was why he was he couldn't get a fight after the Ali second Ali um, loss. I mean, it was everybody thought it was a fix. I mean, during the Keith Alver, Keith Alver um, hearings, named for the Senator Estes Keith Alver, into organized crime, there were huge headlines. People took the fifth. Blinky Palermo was called and asked about his relationship with Sonny and took the fifth. And when Sonny was called, uh, he was asked, it was a, another example of kind of the racist subtext to a lot of his the dealings with him. If, um, if he could, if he could somehow write a check that had a comma in it and he said, no, um, uh, the point being he was made to appear, you know, unintelligent enough to be manipulated by the mob, but but these were headline hearings and Sonny's 
relationship was a headline relationship. Okay, so this unfolded in real time and it was probably part of the reason people had suspicions over him. And it was part of the reason the civil rights people didn't want anything to do with him as well. I mean, you know, yeah. Okay. Uh, it sounds like the vast majority of people who look into this in any great way will conclude what you've concluded, which is that Sonny Liston in January 1971 was murdered. This was not natural causes. I think so. And um, to somebody who recently asked me, well, you know, why dig this up now? Mm. Um, if you believe he was murdered, then the person who did it is still out there or at least has never been brought to justice if that person is still alive. Why look into it now? I'm, I happen to believe that there are still crimes that can be solved. Um, it's not just, it just end at Sonny's death. Mm. And I, excuse me for, I don't know if, if it's in the end of the book. I mean, you mentioned going to see the rogue cop uh, turned criminal in the 1980s, so he denies it. Uh, if you take that at face value, I mean, uh, are your, is, is your, are your kind of um, focus looking squarely at the mob or could there be even another third party involved here that we don't know much about? Um, you know, if, if, if your viewers want to read the book, I kind of don't want to give away the end, sure. but you'll see that I do point, um, the end of the book does point to one figure a little bit more than the others, but it's, it's so much like this, Joe, it's really hard for me to tell. Yeah. I suspect we may not get the conclusive answer at this stage. Uh, listen, Sean, absolutely fascinating stuff. So what, January 1971, this all kicked off. And the book, which I'm sure people will be interested in reading, is called The Murder of Sonny Liston, Las Vegas, Heroin and Heavyweights. Sean Asale, thanks so much, Sean. It's a pleasure, Joe. Thank you.